Welcome to... Insert name a starting point here. Just so we're all on the same page, turn and look at the... Church slash not a church. Are you looking? Good. Welcome to... Insert name a starting point here. Designed by Temple Lushington Moore. No, really, that's his name. As this is the start of the tour, we shall start from the start of Moore's life and give you a bit of a background on the man, the myth, the middle name. Temple Lushington Moore, son of Captain George Frederick Moore and Charlotte Riley, was born in Tullamore, Ireland, on the 7th of June, 1856. Having left the Emerald Isle and moved to Glasgow, Temple and his brother would often run down to the docks at lunchtimes to sketch the ships. What do we do now? Let's go sketch the ships, brother! I do have a name, you know. I know, and it's a lovely one. Well, come on, brother, those ships won't sketch themselves! All that ship sketching had a lasting effect on the Moore brothers, as Temple would go on to become one of Britain's most notable architects, and his brother, who must not have enjoyed the sketching quite so much, went on to become a tea planter. A representative from the unions here, sir. Ah, oh, there's no need to be so formal. I, I do have a name, you know. By all means, use it. Oh, of course, Mr. Moore. And now let us move on and discover how Temple Moore moved to Yorkshire and began to build his future. Temple Lushington Moore came to Yorkshire through a family connection, Richard Wilton. Reputedly a fine fellow, an all-round good egg. How about some taffy? I'm sorry, I've already eaten. All right, how about, um, uh, ooh, a kitten! As I said, I've already eaten. All right, then. How about my daughter, Emma? Oh, that's a tasty dish. I thought you said you'd already eaten. Well, there's always room for dessert. Moore also had the good fortune of meeting George Gilbert Scott Jr., the son of George Gilbert Scott, the famous architect, whose works include the St. Pancras Renaissance Hotel in London, the Leeds General Infirmary in Leeds, and various lunatic asylums across the country. Moore was articled as an apprentice to Scott Jr., which must have proved interesting, as George Gilbert Scott Jr. was battling the demons of mental illness and alcoholism. Temple, my boy! How long's it been? Um, about four and a half minutes, sir. To absent friends! <sighs> well, I, I finished the design you asked for, sir. I think you'll find it's as brilliant a design as you could have possibly hoped for. Wonderful! That calls for a celebration, Chin Chin! Mm. Right. My boy, this is, this is marvellous! It's even better this way around! You are taking to this like a duck to water. I just have one question. Where will the camel live? George Gilbert Scott Jr. would eventually become known as the Middle Scott. Godspeed! Sandwiched between a brilliant father and his equally brilliant son Giles, most notably famed for designing the iconic red phone box. Daddy! Daddy! Look what I've designed! My boy, this is wonderful. You're taking to this craft like a duck to water. I only have one question, though. Where will the camel live? The doctor said you won't talk about camels anymore, Daddy. The doctor can kiss my architect! Temple Moore completed his apprenticeship in 1878. God, I'm so alone. But continued acting as assistant to Scott Jr. for another seven years or so, more than likely finishing off the work that Scott Jr. was no longer able to deal with. The road you have just... Driven. Walked. 
recycled? ...into Billsdale was not constructed until the 1930s. Before this, the sleepy village of Billsdale was just that. Sleepy. The church in front of you took two and a half years to be built, and was finally consecrated by the Archbishop of York, William McLagan, on the 12th of October, 1896. The foundation stone of the church was laid by the patron of Helmsley Parish, the Earl of Feversham, who was the driving force behind having the church constructed. Feversham commissioned many of Moore's projects, including St. Aidan's Church in Carlton and St. Chad's in Sproxton. A Scot-driven project with his student Temple Moore, St. Chad's was moved brick by brick one and a half miles down the road to its current site. The foundation stone for St. John's bears a cross upon it, the signature mark of Temple Lushington Moor. It was amazing the church was constructed in just two and a half years, as a story states that the workers used to say, Right, we'll toss a coin, and if it stays up in the air, we'll work. But if it comes down, we'll go down sun in for a beer. You're on. Did you toss it? Aye. Bugger. Bugger. Here, you two, you're paying my fundament. Get back to work. Even with these hilarious shenanigans, the work was done, and in 1898 the church was given its own new parish, Billsdale Midcable, a shortening of Middle Chapel, as the church stands in the middle of the dale. St. Aidan's Church in Carlton is the earliest surviving church independently designed by Moore after the demolition of St. Bartholomew's Church in Dover, which was his first. Prior to these designs, Moore would have worked in conjunction with Scott Jr., to whom he was apprenticed and later partnered to. The church is of particular interest because it exhibits many of the characteristics that would become synonymous with Moore's later works. Moore was an architect of the late Gothic Revival, meaning that he came at the end of a movement born of an enthusiasm for the return to a pure form of architecture. This pure form was identified as the Gothic forms of the 14th century, in particular early middle pointed. In reference to the ruined abbeys of Yorkshire, Moore was described as speaking Gothic with a Yorkshire accent. To quote Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Principle Gothic architecture is infinitely made imaginable. To quote Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the principle of Gothic architecture is infinity made imaginable. Hey. Can they not go on me twang? Mr. Moore inquires, E, can you not understand my speech? The Stain Kirk with a wee spire, and a vera wee south aisle. The rhododendrons bloom without, for there's something in the painted roof, and the mouldings round the door, the broad bench and the plain font that tells a temple more. Revival in the North, John Betjeman, 1976. The picturesque and secluded church of St. Mary Magdalene's East Moors has captured the imagination of many including art and architecture historian Sir Nicholas Pevsner, and poet, writer, and broadcaster Sir John Betjeman. The church was initially designed by Gilbert Scott Jr., but due to Scott's mental decline in alcoholism, Temple Moore oversaw the completion of the project. Left a bit. Left a bit. Left a bit. Uh, you might want to move. This is how we lost the last one. Oh, there it goes. The church was built in 1882 when the population of the moor was a mere 200 and is the first of Temple Moor's churches to feature his characteristic painted wagon roof. To quote Pevsner, the young architect obviously enjoyed his job thoroughly and his pleasure is still infectious. We've had a good run of it, old girl, but it was never going to work out between us. I'm so sorry. Situated four and a half miles out of Helmsley, the clergy would have had to travel to the church on the Saturday night and would have slept in hammocks in the church in order to be at Sunday service on time. 
It is believed that St. Ba... St. Bo... Ta- Sa- it is believed that St. Bees is the northernmost of all churches dedicated to... the aforementioned saint. Oh, oh, hello! Oh, hello! Are you a pigeon? You are, aren't you? Have you got something for me? Oh, look at this! What does this say? <laughs> you don't know, do you? You're a pigeon! <laughs> it's official! We got it! We're the northernmost! <laughs> The church was completed in 1897, a design typical of Moore, sourcing local materials and using a classical style. This, however, was not the first church to stand on the site. The previous church, which had been badly in need of renovation, was taken to heart by George Sanger, who saw the fruits of his labours come to fruition in 1882. Unfortunately, Sanger's fruits exploded like an overripe ticking time bomb and burnt down the night before its dedication. That's it! I quit! Yeah, that was a very convincing reverence. Very convincing indeed. Hey! The task of rebuilding the church, again, fell to Sanger's successor, Canon John Kyle. I never done nothing! That's a double negative, Father. If you haven't done nothing, You've done something, haven't you? What? <laughs> Morning! Morning! Morning. <laughs> oh, come on! Though they found him not guilty, Sanger was now a broken man, having put his all into the building of the church that had succumbed to the flame. Vicar Gray, as well as Lord Feversham, were instrumental in the commissioning of many of Moore's works in North Yorkshire. Whilst Feversham would provide some of the money and the consent of the landowners, it was Vicar Gray who thought up many of the projects. Moore, initially under the tutelage of Scott, and eventually under his own practice, was employed to design what Gray had envisioned. strict, Charles Norris Gray led a non-nonsense life in the vicarage. The day began at 6am with a cold bath. The vestry door was locked at 6.55am to prevent lollygagging and tardiness for the service that started at 7am sharp. So late. Come on, we're so very late. Oh God, I I shouldn't say, oh God, bless me, bless us. Come on, dear, come on. We're so very late. Come on, pick up your feet, you. Oh... This is your fault. Breakfast at the vicarage passed with no conversation allowed. But then I thought, you've got to watch your figure, old chap. So why don't you have two sausages? And then there's the option of a third. I'm sorry, Vicar Gray. I've been going on and on and on and on, haven't I? I, don't, I can't help it. I get so excited about breakfast. Um, Vicar Gray? Is everything all right? Breakfast was the only meal of the day until 9pm, when Gray found time to eat with his curates. Rules were obeyed in the vicarage and the church to the extent that notes were made of any mistakes a curate might make in the taking of service. If you turn your head 45 degrees and observe this piece of paper pinned to the door, you will see it reads why you are rubbish. Number one. The christening this morning was a fiasco. I'm sorry, Your Shut up! Number two, funerals are not supposed to be funny. I thought a couple of jokes Shut up! And number three, it's pronounced Jesus, not Jesus. 
Ten thousand apologies, Your Eminence. I'll never do it again, I promise. A forthright orator, Vicar Gray was known to hold many an opinion on a variety of subjects, and often published articles in his own parish magazine. For example... If at any time the milk seems to disagree, a tablespoonful of lime water should be added to each bottleful. Give the child no other nourishment whatever. Tea, beer, whiskey, and other stimulants, cheese, fruit, and pastry. There's also soothing medicines, sleeping draughts, Cordials, teething powders, etc. should never be given. Within days of his arrival in the parish, Gray started a Sunday school for the young people of Helmsley. His curates were asked to pay special attention to the young people of the town and surrounding hamlets. Gray was also concerned with the apprentices of Helmsley. Is the sort of life they have a healthy one? Either morally or physically. Take an apprentice in winter. Up, I suppose, at 8 a.m. so as to have the shop open in good time. And once the shop is open, he will be there until 7 p.m. After 7 p.m., his time is his own. A glorious privilege. So concerned was Gray that the children of Helmsley received a proper education, it is said that he sent the curates out with the ploughboys to walk furrows with them and give them their lessons while they worked. If King Herod walks across Galilee at approximately 3.14 miles per hour and Noah's Ark was ocean-bound for 40 days and 40 nights, at what point will the rapture occur? Um... Jesus? Oh, so close! The answer was just after dinner! One of Gray's obsessions was hygiene and health. His parish magazine contained instructions on almost every aspect of this. Oh, hello again. <clears throat> no house need be dirty. Soap and hot water with a little hard work will do wonders. A woman is worth nothing if she cannot keep her house clean. Other articles emphasized the need for fresh air and the avoidance of bad smells. This came to a head when Gray clashed with the parish council, the sanitary authority, and the chairman of the council, Lord Feversham, over the unsanitary sewage conditions that Gray blamed for an outbreak of typhoid in the village. Be dirty. A little soap and hot water. Gray. We have a rate of one death every quarter of the year by this fever. And him. Feversham, come out and pray. I'll just have to do this myself. Ding, ding. <laughs> of course, this didn't actually happen. This is merely a visceral representation of the sometimes fractious nature of Gray's relationship with Feversham. <laughs> Contrary to everything we've said so far, history will remember Vicar Charles Norris Gray as an innovative and forward-thinking man of the people. 
He died of overwork in February 1913, and such was his generosity in life that upon his death he did not have enough remaining money to cover the bequests in his will. Many beautiful buildings stand before you today, a monument to this colourful character, bold thinker, and great man. <laughs>